just uh, really, really amazing to see you all. And um, yeah, I really feel I really feel what I've got to share this morning is uh, it's from God. I feel like it's what God is doing with us. And um, I don't know, in some measure, I feel like it's the, the culmination of what God is wanting to be forming in us and doing in us as men over this year. And I've kind of been, if I look back at the year, I've, if we look back at even our kind of our man up times, this is the third one. The first one we spoke about taking responsibility out of the garden and how men as under God are meant to take responsibility and not blame Eve and not blame others and, and, and to not keep quiet, but to talk up for truth and to stand up and to take ownership and to, to stand on the head of the serpent. That's what Adam's job, Adam, first Adam should have stood on the head of the serpent so that second Adam didn't, but he didn't. So second Adam had to, Jesus had to stand on the head once and for all and do everything that, that Adam didn't. The second part, man up, we spoke about being the bowl. Remember that silly illustration of the bowl? And how has men, part of our job is just to be a consistent, reliable, trustworthy, environment setting um, space where we create a space for people to be who they're called to be. And starts with our wives and our, and our families. And the way, the, way, the way we lead, the way men are heads of their homes is like a bowl from underneath, not from on top. You don't cap the family. You don't cap your wife. That's not how you're meant to lead. You come from underneath and you serve and you let her be all she's called to be. And we, if you're a leader in a business, Jesus is our bowl. He doesn't control us, but he holds us and he lets us be. And he holds us and he keeps us and he keeps speaking to us. He keeps encouraging us. That's the, that's the role of the bowl. And, um, and part of that is we've got to deal with the holes in our bowls. And part of that I spoke about shame and I spoke about how that can be crippling to us. And part of the reason why we're not good bowls is because we're full of holes. And, we, and as men, we don't deal with our stuff. And then we don't take responsibility for our stuff. And we don't take ownership for our stuff. And we make it everybody else's problem except our own problem. And so we never, ever move forward because it's never our fault. It's always somebody else's fault and it's always that. It's like we never, so instead of owning it and saying, God, actually, I'm reacting badly, I shouldn't. Would Jesus do this? You know, we had the bankers. Would Jesus, what would Jesus do? Bangles. Would Jesus do this? Is, with somebody that is so secure in the love of the Father, and so confident in their God, would they act like this? No. Well, then, actually, it's my problem. No matter how badly, no matter what's going on out there, own it. And, we, and I spoke about the code, a code that we can have. What are, what are the three words that will hold us to account for when we're acting badly? What are three words that actually, when you look back, those are the areas that I act badly, and, and I'm never going to give that away. If I'm, when I'm in a situation, one of my words is peace. If I'm in a situation and there's, and there's a conflict and there's something happening and there's no peace, that's my problem. I'm meant to bring peace. Why am I not bringing peace? How am I not bringing peace? How am I? So it's kind of that uh, we spoke about those things, about ownership, responsibility, being this. This morning I want to go back to the garden and ask this question. What was lost in the garden? And if you think about what was lost, that Jesus had to restore, it was this thing called authority. Authority was lost. So Adam and Eve, Adam in particular, was given authority to work and to tend and to take care of a garden. He abdicated that responsibility. He didn't protect the garden, he didn't guard the garden and his wife got taken out and then he got seduced into that and got deceived and all the rest of it and then he blamed, when God asked him what's going on, he blamed his wife 
But what happened is they forfeited the authority as they stepped out of submission to God. Authority. You see, they were given, they were meant to have authority to take what was in the garden, their relationship with God, which was born out of their relationship with God, and to extend the boundaries and the perimeter of that garden until the glory of God covered the earth. That was their mandate. Their mandate was to, with authority, go into dark places and bring light. Go into, into evil spaces and bring love. They, 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 they had authority to do that. They were given authority to do that. And what happened was, is they lost it. And so again, second Adam, Jesus has to come back. And in Matthew 28, what does he say? He says this, all authority has been given to me. Now go and make disciples of all nations. Now get back into the plan that you originally were meant to have. Authority. And the problem is, is authority has become a little bit of a dirty word because there's been so many illegitimate and bad forms of authority, hurtful f forms of authority, whether it's authority figures in the home or authority figures in the workplace or in, in, in government political spheres, that actually nobody wants to be under authority and, 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 and even the idea of authority is kind of despised. And so Jesus has to come back to the disciples and he has to say to them, listen guys, you've been given authority, but the authority that you've been given is not like the, what the world has. We don't lord it over. We come to serve. It's that kind of authority. It's the authority that is kingdom authority. It's not, it's not political authority. It's not positional authority. It's not by title. It's an innate authority that comes from being with me, from carrying the king. It's an authority where you don't have to shout. It's an authority where you don't have to manipulate. It's an authority that you carry because Jesus is in you and you walk with him. This is the kind of authority that I'm talking about. And I believe God is wanting us to walk in. You see, you have religious authority. The Pharisees imposed religious authority on the people. Well, if you want to do this God's way, this is the way you've got to do it. And these are the rules that you've got to abide by. And they killed Jesus. Because he wouldn't. And then you had the Roman authorities, which killed Jesus. Because again, he wouldn't. But it's an amazing thing is that the, the authority that Jesus carried allowed him to go to the cross and have his ultimate victory. You see, it's a very different understanding of authority. Godly authority out of a relationship with and backed by God. Not proving, not protecting, not striving, not, but humble, secure, serving, strong. It's kingdom authority. And friends, this authority that Adam and Eve lost is what we as men in particular are meant to carry. The reason why we have gender-based violence, friends, is because men are striving for authority, are frustrated and insecure, so they impose violent authority instead of loving authority. It's because they've been stripped uh, emasculated now we've got to be reformed and retaught what it means to be a man and to carry legitimate authority friends the kingdom of God is about authority that's why it's called a king and a kingdom it's about the release of authority it's about the carrying of authority your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven that is about the release of authority on earth as it is in heaven to get things done, to shift environments. It's the kind of authority that, I think I, I, I read stories of Smith Wigglesworth sitting on a train. He was an old school um, healing evangelist. He'd walk into a train, sit in the train booth, and without saying anything, the people in the booth would start confessing and repenting. It's because he so carried the authority of the kingdom. 
that the revelation of Jesus started coming to people. See, this kind of authority, you don't even have to say anything. The presence of God opens the way. But this kind of authority, when you do speak, people listen. All of us, every single one of us, need to be growing in authority. Growing in authority. You know, friends, you don't need, isn't it incredible? God just needed one man, Jesus, under the authority of heaven to change everything. Think of it. You think, well, if you wanted to change all things, which is the way Israel sought, is you need to develop, you've got to get an army going. God says, no, 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 all I need is a son. Just one. One son under my purpose and plan, learning to grow in my authority, because Jesus grew in favor with God and with people, learning to grow in his authority, receive and receive his call, receive the plan for his life, and submit to me. You can't be an authority unless you're in submission. Worked out his plan of salvation for the whole earth, one person. And remember, he was a man. That man gathers 12. And then leaves. With the power of the Spirit left for the 12. So that no matter where the 12 are, it was like he was with them. So that they can continue to live in the authority that he gave them. And they changed the world, friends. If Jesus only needed 12 to change the world, why do we need more? That's why Jesus is not looking for big churches. He's looking for big people. And when I say big people, people who know who they are and whose they are, that know how to live in the authority that they've been given. This is an unbelievably powerful concept. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says this, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. See, the authority that the church carries, the gates of hell cannot stop it, friends. That is not, that is the church advancing. It has authority. Light has authority over darkness. Keys, you've been given the authority, the keys of the kingdom to unlock. What about Matthew 11, verse 28? By what authority are you doing these things that ask Jesus? Who gave you the authority to do this? Jesus was one that taught, like, not like the others. He talked like one who had authority. What does that look like? And Jesus gives you himself so that you can do the same. The problem is we don't believe it. We know it, but there's a gap between knowing it. The problem is we've been into too many sermons and we've listened to too many people talk but we've had no life change in our hearts. We don't believe it. We don't believe it. And so we don't live in the authority that actually God has given us. I'm telling you guys, God is putting men and women, but men for this context, into different contexts, into different places, into schools and into government. Unless you're carrying authority, you'll not change that school or place that you're in. He's putting you there because you carry kingdom authority. You don't have to scream, shout, manipulate, be political, and get people to vote for you and all those things. You carry it. You are it. This is what I'm talking about today. All authority has been given to you. What is authority? It's different to power. Dunamis is the word for power in the New Testament. Authority in the, in the New Testament is exousia. Power means ability or gifting. And it's incredible, friends. The church chases power. We all want to see the power of God. The problem is power is released through gifting. It can be, it's a gift from God. It's a manifestation gift. It's the different gifts. You can, you can be released. Power can be released. The gift of healing. 
and we chase it. So in many respects, power can come because it's God's gift. The problem is authority doesn't come like that. Authority comes because God does has to do work in you to grow. It's different. It's a different word. It's a different idea. In Luke chapter 9, verse 18, Jesus called the 12 together and, and he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Two different concepts, two different words. If the church could just chase authority and give themselves to the processes of God so that we could walk in authority, I'm saying my greatest prayer right now, God, I want to increase in authority. Show me, teach me. Moses is a prime example. Imagine all the issues Moses had to deal with. He was rejected by his parents and put into a basket to go down. Not rejected, but saved. But you know what? As a boy growing up, hey, listen, mom and dad didn't really like me, didn't really love me. I had to grow up in Pharaoh's home. Grows up in Pharaoh's home. His mom is his, is his nanny. She starts to speak, speak to him, hey, listen, well, maybe I'm somebody. And then he comes and he uses illegitimate authority and kills somebody. Because he thinks he's somebody growing up in Sarah's home. God says, no, listen, but that's not the kind of authority I want to give you, bud. You don't get your authority from Pharaoh. Can, we do not get our authority from politicians. The kingdom of God feels nothing for politicians and their antics. The kingdom of God is bigger. I'm saying this profoundly. I wish I would just remind myself of it every now and again because I get so frustrated. Eventually, he runs off into the desert. He gives it all up. You know, when, you know when authority really starts growing in our lives? When we actually just surrender it. We realize we can't do it. He runs into the desert. God has to deal with him for 40 years. He's got a stutter. I can't talk. He sees a bush. The Bible says, it says when he looked at the bush, he could not look at God. He didn't even know what it was. He couldn't look at it. We think, well, was it the holiness of God? He couldn't look at the holiness of God. I wonder whether it had to look, do with the shame that he carried from all the stuff that he did. And he couldn't look. God starts to work in that man. And he speaks to that man. And he says, now this is my job for you. You're going to go back and you're going to fetch my people. One man saves a whole nation. God does not need numbers when he has men of authority. One man. But Lord, I can't. Yeah, okay, well, I'll send you Aaron, but you're still going. God is so gracious. Pharaoh, I want you to give them up. No, I'm not going to do it. Well, then you're going to have trouble. But who are you, Moses? Serpent's rod turns into a snake. Yeah, but then the other guys come. Yeah, but I can do that as well. The problem is his snake eats their snakes. He carries greater authority carries real authority. Ooh. Plagues. All this stuff happens and then God sets them free. Man of authority. Authority matters, friends. Authority matters. There's a difference between authority and power. You've got to grow in authority. And when you have authority, power flows. You don't need, it, it, there's something of this. And I'll tell you why it flows. Because the reason why, the reason why, we, the why we can grow in authority, we'll make it clear for you when I get there now. Adam and Eve and Israel have been given authority. The husband's been given authority, friends. But to be the bowl, not to be the cap. 
not to be the controller, not to be the one that's... Leaders have been given authority. In Titus it says this, 2 verse 15, it says, then these are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anybody despise you, Titus. Authority is given. Preaching. When you preach the word, it comes with authority because the word has authority to change lives. But what happens, friends, when we live our lives, we slip into business mode. And we read every flippin' leadership book that we can get our hands on to try and be better. Is that wrong? No, of course not. I also lead, read, lead, read leadership books. But leadership books don't give you kingdom authority. They make you better organizers and managers and better ways to do things and better self-help and better organized and better all these things but it doesn't give you kingdom authority. Spiritual authority doesn't come from leadership books. Spiritual authority comes from God, from the king. When we call to be ambassadors of the kingdom, you don't need a leadership, you don't need John Maxwell's latest book. To be an ambassador of the kingdom and to stand before Pharaoh, John Maxwell not going to help you, friends. Not anything against, I've got lots of John Maxwell books. Please, don't hear what I'm not saying. My point is this, you need kingdom authority. You need authority. When you're standing before a school board, because what they're doing is wrong and it needs, they need to go a different way. What changes them? Votes? No. Kingdom authority changes that. When you're before your company's board and things are going, kingdom authority with wisdom from on high changes things. It's something we can grow in, friends. It's something we must grow in. It's something that can be pursued. It's something that can be learned. It's something that can be advanced as we mature in him. So, three big things about authority. Authority is rooted in identity. Very important. Authority is rooted in identity. It grows in intimacy with God and with others, but with God. And it's exercised by faith. Kingdom authority is rooted in identity, it grows in intimacy, and it is exercised in faith. Identity, intimacy, and faith. Of yes, of course, Stan. Yes, of course. Nothing new under the sun. That simple. Identity, intimacy, and faith. Do you know that there's two times in the scriptures where God speaks to his son audibly, Jesus? One at his baptism and one on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember what he says to him. This is my son, whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased. And at the Mount of, Trig Mount of Tra Transfiguration, he says this with an exclamation mark, listen to him. added to that. The two times that God speaks audibly to his boy, it's about identity. The reason why Jesus walked in the authority that he walked in as a man was because he knew his father loved him. Because he knew who he was and whose he was. How do, you, if you know, how do you know if you're rooted in your identity? 
Good question. And we go through it all the time. It's called the testing loop. It's called the revelation and testing loop. God speaks to us and then it gets tested. God speaks to us and then it gets tested. God speaks to us, this is my son whom I love and when I'm well pleased and he takes you into a desert. If you are the son, make the stones bread. Testing loop. We all go through it and most of the testing is in a desert time. It's in a tough time, it's a dark time. But those times are the testing times where God is establishing in us the truths of the revelation of who we are and our identity with him. Jesus was affirmed by his father then he was led into the spirit to be tested. Led by the spirit of God eh, into the desert to be tested. See, when you're full of the spirit, remember Jesus was baptized and the spirit came upon him. And then he's led into the desert and his identity is tested. Full of the Spirit plus a strong identity equals news about him spread everywhere. In Luke chapter 4. So it's like full of the Spirit, identity affirmed. Suddenly there's this, there's this power and authority being released from him and wherever he goes, the news about him is spreading everywhere. People are coming to him. That's what happens. Full of the Spirit plus an identity. Full of the Spirit, but no identity. Christian hedonism. We keep chasing after the river to be filled all the time and filled all the time and filled all the time and filled all the time. I'm a son, I'm a son. No, friends. We are sons. This is my son. You are my son, whom I love and with whom I'm, I'm well pleased. Full of the Spirit and news about him spread everywhere. That's us. And so the church is chasing power, and it's chasing full of the Spirit, but never allowing God to deal with our identity and maturity so that actually the two together can lead to this radical shift of authority where God is doing stuff through our lives in the, in the, in the most easy, unbelievable way possible. See, God wants to empower men with formed identities to bring the kingdom and to bring good news about Jesus into every area of their lives, into every area of our lives, friends. Identity. Isn't it incredible that Jesus commissions the, the 72, go out and do your thing. When the disciples cast out demons, they were thrilled and they said to Jesus, hey, even the demons submit to your name. Jesus celebrated them. Hey, wonderful. But then he says to them, but don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. That's wonderful you walk, you're moving in power. But remember who you are. Remember where your name is. Don't ever lose where your name is. That power comes because your name's there. That power comes because of who you are. He wants them to rejoice in their identity, not in their ministry success. He wants them to never forget them, their identity. Famous text, Hebrews chapter four. Approach God's grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We know that one. You know, friends, when we belong to a family, we're not scared to ask the Father for what we need. You know, visit, visitors don't just come to, it's old illustration, visitors don't just come to your fridge and help themselves. What's there? Hey, what can I chow? bit of cheese, half a block of cheese. <laughs> hey, leftover steak. Hey, cheapest, that looks like it's going to waste. No, that was supper for tonight. No, but anyway, we'll have it for breakfast. <laughs> Kids, children, family, visitors.
You see, when we're carrying issues that make us feel like outsiders, we never really approach the throne of grace with confidence. How confident are you at the throne of grace? Not just for your sin. Not just for your sin. For who you are. It's hard to trust them in the dark when we're not in the light about who we are. It's hard to trust them in the dark when we're not in the light about who we are. The problem is it's this gap between knowing the truth and living it out. See, knowledge is informational, but revelation is transformational. And this is this gap that we wrestle with, especially if you've been in church for any length of time. You've heard it all before. It's the most dangerous thing in the world. We've heard it all before. It's the gap between what we know and what has not yet been made to us, known to us by the Spirit of God. There's a difference. I know it, but has it been, is it revelation to you? Is it, yeah, is it like, that actually changes my life. It changes, it changes to revelation that leads to repentance, that leads to, oh my gosh. I can't be the same again, I've seen it. See, we've got to create space for God to reveal himself to us. We've got to create space for God to listen to his voice. You know, you know that... Is this the last point I've got on this? I've got millions, but. You know, you know the, the famous line, we, we quote it. The truth will set you free. You know that one? John chapter eight? So actually all we need is the truth and then the truth will set us free. You know the truth and the truth will set you free. Why is it not setting us free? You know it. I know it. Why is it not setting me free? Why have I still got insecurities? Why do I still doubt the goodness of God? It's because we haven't read the line before. In John chapter 8, verse 31, it says this, to the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're really my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That word hold it's the same word in John chapter 15 as abide or remain. Same word. So he says, if you hold to my truth, if you hold to my teaching, if you abide in it, it means to stay or remain or live or dwell or abide, to be in a state that begins and continues yet may or may not end or stop. That's, what, that's the, from the dictionary that I had. It, it means to abide means to live in it. It means to stay in it. It means to constantly be in it. And then the truth will set you free. To just have it in your head and then gone, it's got to be constantly in your head because your head loses it until it gets into your heart and it becomes revelation. We have that old saying, it's uh, from your head to your heart. It's knowledge to revelation. That's the, that's the journey that I'm talking about here, to abide. To abide in Christ is to follow his example of, of life obedient to the will of God. That's what it means to abide. It means to follow his example in an, an obedient life to God. That's abiding. It's following it. It's holding. It's doing. It's what we have to do with our issues of our identity. I've got three basic lies that we believe that I'm going to move on to Intimacy. Let me just give you the three basic lies so that we, three basic lies that we believe, and I think this is true because it's kind of experientially, certainly my life, and those that I've ministered to. The people-pleasing lie, my value is dependent on whether people like me. The performance lie, the issue of my value is dependent on my performance. I dis Friends, at some stage, at some stage, you've got to disconnect your doing from your being. 
You've got to disconnect the call of God of your life from your value. Even if you're a failure, God is, you're still valuable in God's eyes. And we cannot compute that. We cannot get to the place where we surrender the fact that actually I'm valuable in God's eyes before I do anything. It's the performance lie. And so we constantly strive in, in nice Christian ways, spirit-filled ways. And it never really gets into our hearts that I'm valued by God. This is my son whom I love and whom I love and with whom I'm well pleased. And then the control lie. The people pleasing lie, the performance lie, and the control lie. The issue of my value is dependent on whether I can remain in control. Even as a leader. If anybody's told you that you're controlling, it's because you are. <laughs> no, it's not you, it's our reasons. No, it's not me. It's not, it's never, never me. It's all these people, it's just their perception. No, what about getting to the Father and saying, you know, they Lord, just maybe I am. Just on this last thing, just around control, because this is me. Sometimes it's not always about controlling people. It's more about controlling outcomes and results. And when you can't control them, you get angry. Can't control results. I can't control process. If I could get a missile, I would. I can't control Prasa. I can't control F and B in the sale of a house. Both exude huge amounts of anger from my heart. Control issues. Which means, when I lose it, what do you lose? Authority. <laughs> I give away my authority. To be the son, father, business owner, and do what I'm called to do. Why do I want to control the outcomes? Because I think I'm not good enough. Maybe that's you. That's no, true of me. What about intimacy? Jesus grows. You see, this thing grows in intimacy with God. Pardon me. Jesus only, saw, only did what he saw the Father doing, which means he had to be with the Father to do what he's doing. That he grows with intimacy, friends. Identity is at the, is the, at the root of it. But from there, we've got to spend time with God. We want to have this authority. Jesus never ever took on his own assignment. He always got it from the Father. Human need never drove Jesus. In fact, sometimes people would say, but all these people, and Jesus would turn the other way and walk the other direction because he needed to be with his Father in intimacy. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. Nothing new that we haven't heard. But are we doing it? Is it revelation? Father, I've been praying, Lord, give me the authority that when I say these words, it unlocks people's hearts. Hard hearts, resistant hearts, whatever kind of heart. You see, we think Jesus lived this balanced life and wasn't busy. It's all about balance. It's not all about balance, friends. It's busy. Jesus lived a flat-out busy life. 
But he retreated to refuel with the father all the time in the midst of this busyness. Unless we're retreating to be with him and refueling with him and getting nourishment for our soul and being with him and hearing him and finding peace and getting wisdom and hearing his voice, See, the authority that we come get, we carry, is the heavenly authority of the Father. When we're with Him, we hear His voice, and we say it, it works, it moves. He would do nothing apart from the Father. And we can do nothing apart from Jesus. Abide in the vine, and abide in me, you'll bear fruit, much fruit, lasting fruit. Much fruit. Lasting fruit. We need to get alone with God to abide, to remain, and to work with Him, and to continually to walk with Him. Not just abiding in the, si- in the solitude, but abiding and learning to abide with Him in the everyday life where we're constantly aware of Him and trying to carry this presence. Intimacy. Identity. It's rooted. Authority is rooted in... in it's rooted in... Identity it grows in intimacy, and it's exercised in faith. Friends, it's faith that releases the activity of God. We cannot advance in intimacy with God without faith. It's faith that pleases God, and, and, and what is faith? Faith is knowing that God exists, and He rewards those that earnestly seek Him. So unless you know God exists and is real, you can't have faith. So if God is real, then you've got to know he's real and then you've got to earnestly seek him. It's, it's this thing. You can't have intimacy and faith and identity. Are in, they all overlap and are connected with each other. Our lack of faith keeps us from acting in authority and hinders the work of the kingdom in our lives, through our lives, to our families, to our friends and beyond. And then, friends, we make excuses for our lack of faith. Yeah, but if God wanted to do it, he would do it. Whatever God wants will happen. Yeah. You see, friends, a version of the sovereignty of God that produces a passive faith may make us feel better about no results, but it won't help the kingdom advance. You see, if we put it all on God, then it completely takes us off the hook. And this, this idea of the sovereignty of God and this responsibility of man is a mystery. I don't think anybody will ever understand it. They have for centuries tried to figure this out. It's both at the same time, all the time. But we do need to play our part in that equation, which is have faith. And then allow God to do what he wants to do. And play his part. Honestly, friends... I'd rather trust God for the impossible than be disappointed than live in a fatalistic, faithless, content to see little happening. Faith. There is no honor in the kingdom of heaven for being a skeptic. If we want to live in authority, we cannot be skeptical all the time and cynical all the time. We've got to be full of faith, which means enthusiasm, which means actually we can do, which means actually, I was talking to Mark earlier, you know, you know, you know the faith that Jesus was asked to do, asked Peter to do, he said, get out on the water. You know, the water was not a lake that was calm and serene that he could just winds storm waves walking on the water means a storm and a wave around you keep your eyes on Jesus it's easier said than done I know 
But you know what? Peter learned that. But you know his next action was? You know what Jesus wanted him to learn? When the storm was there, be quiet. When they were all panicking, Jesus just says, be quiet. Storm. Friends, this thing unlocks us. Authority are, are keys that God gives us to unlock things. And we've got to learn to walk with these keys and grow in them. Lastly, just along that thing, I'm talking about faith and trusting God and believing God and not being a skeptic. If we have a theology of power, we have to have a theology of suffering. You have to have both. Because it doesn't always work out. And I don't know why. That's a mystery. But to have a theology of suffering without a theology of power is to completely pervert the Gospels. We've got to have both. Faith matters, and I'm responsible for developing my faith, just as I'm responsible for developing my intimacy and maturity in Christ and my identity with Him. And it's all three of those things, friends, somehow it seems to show, the scriptures seem to show Jesus growing in authority more and more and more. And so much of this faith often comes in the place of desperation. In the place of absolute desperation. You know why? Because it's until we're absolutely dis- desperate that we really surrender to God. It's until we're absolutely desperate that we actually say, God, I give up, I can't do this. It's in that supreme place of desperation that we realize, actually, I cannot move forward without him. Actually, I can only do this with Jesus. You see, it's that desperation that reveals our fears and what our eyes and our priorities are and our, the holes and our insecurities. It's, it's in that place that suddenly our identity starts to get worked on and our, and our intimacy. Suddenly we're spending lots of time with God and desperation and suddenly our faith. And as we're spending lots of time with God and our identity is being worked on, our faith begins to soar, starts to grow, and God begins to break through. Faith. Authority is rooted in identity, it grows in faith, it grows in intimacy, and is expressed through faith. We are called to be people of authority. God is, Jesus has taken it back and given it to us. Not in its weird forms, not in its overbearing forms, and its serving humble, God-loving kingdom forms, people-serving, God-loving forms. The kingdom of God comes through people of authority. And I trust that we will all endeavor to grow in it. It's actually phenomenal. I've read this last year, I've had such a journey of, and you've kind of been on the journey with me, God speaking to me about shame, God speaking about faith. Shame has got to do with identity and God speaking about intimacy and how we've, how the things of the heaven, without being with God, that you don't unlock them. It's by grace. But it's, but it's this walk with Him. And I feel like I was actually asked to do a talk on authority at the Richmond Church a couple of weeks ago on a Friday. And Johan said, please will you talk on authority? And I'm like, oh, flip, Really? Then, like, don't really feel that. Like, what, what am I going? Like, you know. And then I started getting into it, and 
And suddenly the lights went on and I thought, actually, Lord, by your grace, you've actually shown me what all this is about, is you wanting to restore authority to your church. You know, the authority that you carry is not dependent on your age. It's dependent on your formation and your life. And we don't all have the same authority. We've got different forms of it and different things. I was saying to Mark earlier, imagine what, what he's going through now and wrestling through and trying to hold his head through and messing it up sometimes and blowing it other times and then God speaking to him. And what, what if God was, this was the testing moment of turn this bread into, turn these stones. No, 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 no. I only live by every word that comes from the mouth of the Father. I can, but I'm not. If you will just worship me, I'll give you everything. Jesus knew he was going to get everything anyway. Why would he take a shortcut?